And in verse 47, he's given these pronouncements of, well, we already covered the lawyers. Well, now he's talking about the Pharisees again. And in verse 47, he says, Woe unto you, for ye build the sepulchres of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. So it's, you know, it's just a perfect picture of what's going on, of what they're doing. The fathers, their fathers are the generation of vipers, those who created those traditions, and they were not following God's law, but following their own traditions. They were the ones who killed the prophets. Hebrews chapter 11 talks about how you know, Isaiah was sawed in half and they persecuted. They didn't want to believe the, the message of the prophets. Rather, they brought up their own false prophets and who said when God's prophets were saying, if you, don't, if you don't go back to, if you don't change your mind, you don't repent and go back to God's law covenant, then God's going to bring you into Babylonian captivity, 70 years of captivity. That was God's prophets. The, but they didn't want to hear that message. They don't want to hear that. They want to be able to continue in their evil deeds and still be blessed by God. So then they brought up false prophets who said that, who said, oh yeah, you'll find peace. You'll have peace here. You'll be okay. And so then they could snuff out God's word. They could deny the truth. It's clear in God's law that the prophets were of God, what they were saying, because it goes along with the five cycles of chastisement in Leviticus 26. So what they do is, well, they just kill those prophets. But yet, you've got those religious leaders in Jesus' day, they build the sepulchers of the prophets. So it shows, really, they're, they act like they're honoring the prophets by building sepulchers, but it's just an outward show. It's, they're not really honoring them because they're going to kill. They, they killed John the Baptist. They beheaded him. He was uh, greater, the greatest prophet so far because born of women there was no prophet greater than John because of the message that he gave and they killed him and now they're going to kill the greatest prophet of them all the the Lord Jesus Christ we saw there in um, chapter 11 verse 32 at the end he says behold a greater than Jonas is here he's greater than that prophet Jonah but yet they're going to kill him but yet it seems like they honor the prophet so it's just showing you a great picture of what religion does religion tries to snuff out the truth of God's word and tries to kill the messenger, but then at the same time look good by honoring, you know, honoring their heritage, that type of thing. And it says there in verse 48, Truly ye bear witness that ye allowed the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and ye build their sepulchers. Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets which is shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. So this generation of vipers, they're the ones of Satan, their father is the devil, they believe the lie program, but yet they appear to be, like Satan, he appears to be an angel of light, even so they're false ministers, same thing as uh, Paul told the Corinthians about. Well, so too, these religious leaders appear to be on God's side, but they're not really. They're just, they're on Satan's side, and so because... The generation of vipers, all those following Satan, believing in the light program, they're the ones responsible for killing the prophets. In other words, the regular, you know, the Romans, for example, Pilate, he didn't have any problem with Jesus. He says, I find no fault in him. He didn't want Jesus to be killed. He figures, I mean, he might, might, might have thought that he's a nut, a nut job, nut case, but that's no, no reason to kill somebody. I mean, a logical, rational person isn't going to kill somebody just because they're they have some ideas you don't agree with. But if those ideas are really the truth of God's word, and you are of the generation of vipers, you're on the other side, you're of Satan, then you're going to try to kill them. And so the, the prophets and those religious, the, the people on God's side, are really killed by the people on Satan's side. And so that's why the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, is put upon those religious leaders. It says there in verse 51, from the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple, verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation, those generation of vipers. The reason it says Abel to Zacharias is that a Jewish Old Testament, while it contains the exact same books that our Gentile Old Testament does, it is in a different order. The first book is Genesis, like ours, but the last book is the Chronicles, which contains First and Second Chronicles. And so in a Jewish Old Testament, the first one killed was Abel. Genesis chapter 4, Cain killed his brother Abel. Cain was 
really the father of, well, I don't know if you want to call him the father of religion because Adam uh, started religion with sowing fig leaves together. Um, but he was, he practiced religion and that he brought to God what God, what he thought should be brought to God rather than what God required. So uh, religion is man's way of trying to get to God. So um, religion killed Abel, Cain killed Abel, Genesis chapter 4. And then the last one in your Jewish Old Testament, the last one killed, is in 2 Chronicles chapter 24. That's Zechariah. So if we look over at uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 24... In verse 20, let's look at verse 19. 2 Chronicles 24, verse 19. Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them again unto the Lord, and they testified against them, but they would not give ear. And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiadiah, the priest, which stood above the people and said unto them, Thus saith God, Why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord, that ye cannot prosper? Because ye have forsaken the Lord, he hath also forsaken you." And they conspired against him and stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king and the court of the house of the Lord. So there you have a prophet speaking for the Lord, and they stone him. Not unlike what they're going to do uh, later on in Acts chapter 7. They co uh, commit the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, stoning Stephen. Uh, but the point is, back in Luke eleven fifty one, 51, when it says, From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zacharias, all these are going to be required of this generation. Basically, it's saying from beginning to end, from the first book, to the last, from Genesis to Second Chronicles in their case, all those people and everybody in between, they were killed, those prophets were killed by religion, and which was the generation of vipers, those on Satan's side. He says, their blood is going to be required of you. In other words, they're going to get a great punishment in the lake of fire. But those who don't believe the gospel of the kingdom, um, just a common Jew, they'll still end up in the lake of fire because they didn't, they don't have that imputed righteousness, but their punishment is going to be a lot less than these religious leaders who actually kill the prophets. And then notice the reaction. Notice the reaction of of religion. They're not pricked to the heart in the sense that they ask, what shall we do and to be saved, to be saved from this great judgment? That's not their answer, but rather it says, verse 53, and as he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to provoke him to speak of many things, laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. So it shows that they truly are the generation of vipers because if they didn't have that hard heart and they realized God's judgment pronounced upon them, they'd be under conviction and they would say, you know, just like those people, Acts 2 verse 37, what shall we do? And then they would believe the gospel. But instead they have the same reaction at the head, at Stone and Stephen, when Stephen pronounced the judgment of God upon them through the through the Holy Ghost, then they then they put their ears to the their hands to their ears and they ran toward them and started yelling and they just started gnashing on with their teeth. That shows the reaction of the generation of vipers, not one of uh, changing their mind, willing to believe the gospel, but one of basically let's get rid of this guy. And so they say, yeah, yeah, keep speaking. In other words. They had their tradition of the fathers, and they were trying to find some way, somehow, where they could get some kind of loophole where Jesus would slip up and say something that they could say, Ah, you're guilty of death just based on what you said, so now we're going to kill you. That's the type of thing here. So that's why, they're, you know, that's why they urge him, you know, keep speaking, keep speaking, because the more you speak, the more we'll, be, <laughs> we'll find something against you. Uh, but, of course, Jesus being the perfect man, as Luke shows him, didn't speak anything wrong, and so they weren't able to they weren't able to catch something out of his mouth to accuse him with. Okay, chapter twelve now, and we'll try to move kind of quickly through this. Is basically the Pharisees have rejected him, they've committed the blasphemy of the Son of Man, and they're trying to catch him, they're trying to get him to where they can kill him. And so chapter twelve is all is basically Jesus' instructions to the little flock. And to get away from that religious system and to be mindful of the things of God's kingdom instead, which is going to be particularly important because they'd be about to go through the tribulation period and they need to reject the mark of the beast. And then also the Antichrist is going to try to offer them riches uh, if they will join that religion. And uh, they need to forget about the, the riches of this world 
and focus on the riches of the kingdom, which they were received by trusting in the gospel and rejecting the religion uh, of the Pharisees of the Antichrist. So excuse me there, I had to get a drink there. Verse 1, it says, In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, so there's a great multitude of people there, it's insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, First of all, beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So the Pharisees, all these religious leaders are there because they're trying to catch them so they can kill them. The Jewish... The regular common Jews are there for the entertainment value, as we saw last week. They're looking for miracles or, you know, what crazy thing will this Jesus say next? So they're looking for the entertainment value. And then you've got the little flock. But all those other people have rejected their, their apostate Israel. So he doesn't talk to them, but he says, he says, uh, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all. So he's coming to his instructions to the little flock to edify them. And the first thing is basically beware of that leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Leaven is a type of sin, and it's the leaven is where they've taken the law and they've thrown sin in with that tradition of the fathers, such that if you follow religion, you're not going to be following God's word. They reject Jesus to the point of killing him. Certainly then you're not going to believe in what God tells you in his word, in the law, and the instructions that Jesus, specifically the instructions he's going to give them to get through the tribulation period, they're not going to be trusting in those things if they're trusting in religion. Um, verse 4, he warns them. He says, I say unto my friends, that's the little flock, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. That's the, the Antichrist when he sets up that Mark of the beast, if you don't take it, you're going to be killed. If you don't worship the image of the beast, you're going to be killed. So he, Jesus says to them, he says, don't be afraid of them because they can kill the body, but then they can't do anything more. So sure, they'll kill you because you won't take the mark, but then God's going to raise you from the dead and you're going to go into the kingdom and be their eternal life, uh, eternal life in the kingdom. They can't stop that from happening. All they can do is kill your body. So don't be afraid of them, but rather fear God. Because if you say, well, if you fear them and you're not killed, you take the mark of the beast. Well, now God says you're, going to, you're not going to make it into the kingdom. You're going to be thrown in the lake of fire. And that's the point there in verse 5. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. So basically the Antichrist is going to kill those, we're going to try to kill those who don't take the mark or, or, or worship the image of the beast. After his reign is over at the end of the tribulation period, then the Lord Jesus Christ come back and he kills those in judgment with fire, those who are that, that apostate system, the, the apostate Israel and the Antichrist and all of his system there. And so he'll kill them. But then he has the power to throw them into the lake of fire, whereas the Antichrist, if he kills somebody, that's the end of his power because God has power over that person's body from then on raising them from the dead, giving them eternal life into the kingdom. So it's saying basically, don't worry about what the Pharisees say. Don't worry about what religion says. Trust God. And he says there in verse 7, he says, Even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, for ye are of more value than many sparrows. The hairs of their head being numbered should uh, point them back to Daniel chapter 3, the three Hebrew children going through the fiery furnace. And... Um, that's a type there. Going through that fiery furnace is a type of the refiner's fire that the uh, that the nation of Israel goes through, which is the tribulation period, the seven years of tribulation period. And if they get through that fire, if they are precious stones, meaning if they believe the gospel of the kingdom and if they obey the law of covenant and endure until the end, then they are going to survive that fire and they're going to be saved, just like the three Hebrew children in Daniel chapter 3 got through the fiery furnace. And it says in uh, Daniel chapter 3 here, uh, so they throw them into the fire, and when they're taken out, in verse 27 it says, Daniel three twenty-seven, and the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was a hair of their head singed, 
neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. So when Jesus says in Luke chapter 12, verse 7, even the very hairs of your head are all numbered, it should point them back to Daniel 3, where it says not even a hair of their head singe. And the point that Jesus is making is that basically the Antichrist in the tribulation period may, if you don't take that mark of the beast, he kills you. You go into the grave, it's no big deal because God is going to resurrect you and he, not only are you going to have, you're going to have basically a, a glorified body, you'll have a new body, but God has, will preserve you such, he knows such detail, even down to the very hairs of your head. He knows how many hairs of head uh, that were on your head, such that when you get into the kingdom, if you, um, you, know, you had, say, 10,000 hairs, I don't know how many hairs somebody has on their head, but if it's 10,000, 10,375, well, God can give you 10,375 hairs when you have your new body. Now, now, now that's not to say, you know, I shouldn't, be, the point of this is that God will restore what you had with your body and also, he's also going to remove the curse of sin. And so you're going to have this glorified body. You'll be clothed in a garment and light, and of light, and so it's actually going to be better. So it's not to say, well, if someone was bald headed, they're not going to have any hair in the kingdom because they only had five. So he's only going to give them five hairs. Uh, that's not what it's saying. But the point is that basically they can destroy the body. They can't kill the soul, and then the soul is going to be resurrected, and then you're going to be given a body that's every bit as good as that body you had before, even to the point of having all your hair that you had. Plus, it's going to be better because it's a glorified body. The curse of sin is lifted. Uh, so that, that's the point there is that they can kill the body, but God's going to resurrect that body, and it's going to be just as good as it was before, even down to the very hair. Plus, it's going to be better. So that's why, the re and that reference to the very hairs of your hair all numbers should bring them back to Daniel chapter 3, to remember, oh yeah, not even a hair of their head was singed. And that's really a type of their body. Even though they may, their body may be killed in the tribulation period, when they're raised to eternal life, they come out on the other end. Uh, their body is just as good as it was, and it would be even better. And then he gives that warning there. Verse 8, also I say, in Luke 12, verse 8, Also I say unto you, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. So again, when you're brought before the Antichrist and his minions, you better not bow down to that image, but be like those Hebrew boys. Don't bow to that image. And then you can be and enter to the kingdom of God, trusting God and his word, and he will save you. He will bring you into the kingdom. Uh, verse 10, you've got that blasphemy of the Holy Ghost he talks about, which we've already discussed. Verse 11, when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. Uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but it shows you how, number one, you can see when they bring you into the synagogues, so it is those religious leaders of the apostate nation of Israel in the tribulation period who are going to be going after the little flock. They'll bring them in, just like Jesus. They took, it's the religious leaders who arrested him, and then they bring them in, into Pilate on some trumped-up charges in order to get him killed. So too, that's what they're going to do. The apostate Israel, following the religious system, is going to try to find the little flock, bring them in the synagogue, bring them in on some trumped-up charges, and then bring them under magistrates and powers. And the idea is Satan's going to try to be working to try to get rid of the gospel because he wants to be, he says he wants to be like the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. So he's trying to get the earth for himself. So he's trying to get rid of all those who are following God. And so they're going to be brought before these magistrates and powers and all the world is going to, is going to see them. And that's when the Holy Ghost is going to be teaching them what to say. And this is how the gospel of the kingdom goes to all the world. Uh, if you hold your place, go over to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24 verse 13 says, But he that shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. 
Verse 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. But as we read earlier, if uh, over Matthew chapter 10, verse 23, it says, uh, Ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. So it may seem like a contradiction. You'll say, now wait a minute here. Matthew 24 says the gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached unto all nations before the end comes. But Matthew 10 says they're only going to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and they won't even get through all of Israel with the gospel before the end comes. Uh, well, obviously, the answer to this is both are true. And the way both are true is they're going from city to city with the gospel of the kingdom in Israel. They're not going to the Gentiles. They're just going to Israel. But then some, they're going to be persecuted by the religious leaders who are going to bring them into their synagogues. Then they're going to take them before magistrates and powers. And now uh, television or whatever, however it is, whatever technology is available at that time, somehow now they're going to be brought and the whole world is going to be broadcast. And basically it's Satan. He's going to say, all right, we're going to show the whole world how we're going to kill these people. And so that you shouldn't follow what these people say, but you need to follow what the Antichrist says. So Satan's trying to get rid of God's testimony. But in fact, the Holy Ghost is going to be preaching through those people, and he's going to be preaching that gospel of the kingdom, and all nations, as a result, are going to hear it. So even though they're only going to cities in Israel, all nations hear the gospel of the kingdom through them being brought to magistrates and powers, and the Holy Ghost is going to be speaking such that now the whole world can hear the gospel of the kingdom and uh, believe it to be saved. <laughs> so Satan's plan ultimately is backfiring, but because Satan is always in unbelief, he doesn't believe anything God says, uh, he'll, he'll just fulfill what God says here. <laughs> okay, we don't have much time, so let's see here. Uh, verse 13, now chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, verse 13. Uh, you have this guy, basically he asked Jesus to divide his inheritance with his brother, which really, uh, it's interesting that in verse 14, Jesus' response is, Ma'am, who made me a judge or divider over you? Uh, well, you think of, that really shows you the, what Jesus did in his first coming. His second coming, he's going to be king of kings, lord of lords. He's going to be a judge over the entire world and the kingdom. But he's not setting up the kingdom on earth like the Jewish religious, or not Jewish religious, the Jews were looking for their Messiah to do. Rather, he came not as a judge or a divider, but he came to be that suffering servant, to fulfill the law perfectly, to be the final sacrifice as atonement for sins for the nation of Israel to release them from being Satan's lawful captive. The judgment will come later. That's at his second coming. And uh, then he gives a parable to show that, you know, you shouldn't be concerned about these material things, but rather it's the spiritual that's important. And it talks to the parable of this guy who says, well, I've got all this, all these goods. And he says, I need to build another barn and then to put more so I can store all my stuff. But then he says, uh, verse 9, uh, verse 20, it says, But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall thou those, those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. And, you know, it's just amazing what Christians try to do with this because uh, the bottom line is this story is only for the little flock in the tribulation period. Don't be storing up, don't be providing savings for yourself. Don't be building a bigger barn to have better savings because it's all going to be taken away from you when you have the mark of the beast. Rather, the instruction is, and we'll see that in verse 33, sell that you have and give it away. And so but people have trouble with this. They try to say this, you know, oh, you shouldn't be greedy. You shouldn't be storing all this stuff for yourself. But you still need to provide for you know retirement, having a nest egg so you can retire. Well, that's not at all what this says. It says basically sell it all, get rid of it all, because it's not going to do you any good. And the parable is only for the tribulation period. We try to apply it to today. It's just completely contradictory because you're supposed to work and provide for yourself, provide for uh, your family, and then to help the household of faith if you can. Um, 
but at the same time, you can still provide for your own retirement. Uh, but, but doing so would be a complete contradiction of what the this parable says. And they'll say, oh, well, you, you know, they try to get out of it. But it's really perverting God's word, twisting it around here. God's word says here, all your riches, just get rid of them. And that's what he says there in verse 33. And we'll get to that uh, fairly shortly here. Uh, and the idea here is in that tribulation period, the little flock, they shouldn't trust in possessions or they'll end up taking the mark of the beast, losing their salvation. And uh, if they don't do that, their possessions are going to be taken away from them anyway. So what good is it? Might as well go ahead and sell it and distribute it according as people have need. And that's what we see them doing at the end of Acts chapter 4. And so he tells them here, Luke 12, verse 22, he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body, what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. And so he's telling them, basically, trust in God's provision. And don't worry about the material stuff. If you trust in that, you're going to end up in trouble. So it goes on from there. Uh, and so therefore, you notice in verse 31, he says, But rather, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. So now, it doesn't mean they're going to get it in the tribulation period, because they're going to have to fast. They're, they're going to be hungry. Uh, but those things, the food and everything, the uh, prosperity is going to be added to them in the kingdom. So they seek the kingdom of God, then they'll be in the kingdom. And then they'll have the material things that they need in the kingdom. Plus, they'll be given a greater position of authority if they are seeking the kingdom of God because they're leading more of the lost sheep of the house of Israel uh, into the kingdom. Verse 32, Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That's where we get the term little flock. Those of the nation of Israel, they are the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They become the found sheep and they in turn then are the little flock. That's in contrast to the nation as a whole. It's only a faithful, believing remnant. Only a, a small portion of the nation believes and is going to be entering into the kingdom. And it says, you know, don't worry about what the Antichrist is doing and how your possessions are taken away. It's, it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You'll enter the kingdom. And so he says, as a result there, sell that ye have, verse 33, sell that ye have and give alms. Provide yourselves ba bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If people are trying to tell you that you need to follow what Jesus says in the Gospels, this is a perfect verse to go to. And it says, sell that you have. And people will say, oh, well, that's only if God calls you. It doesn't say, sell that you have if God calls you. You feel a burning in your bosom to sell what you have. Then you should do it. Or you've got confirmation from God through someone who told you who's a prophet. You know, it's none of that crazy stuff. It says there, it says, sell that you have. Sell. It's, a, it's an implied, um, it's in the uh, imperative mode there. Uh, the implied you is the subject, and which makes it a command. It's sell that you have. In other words, everybody who is part of the little flock, everyone who believes the gospel of the kingdom, is commanded by the Lord Jesus Christ right there to sell what they have and give alms. That's, that's their commandment. There's no getting around it. And so if you try to apply what Jesus says to you today, then whoever tells you to do that, you should say, well, why haven't you sold everything that you have? That's what Jesus commanded. That's what God's Word says in Luke 12, verse 33. And, of course, when we've gone over this, the reason is because their goods aren't going to do them any good because it says... You know, in verse 20, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. At the end of the tribulation period, God's going to be judging the people, and they're either going to go into the kingdom, or they're going to go into outer darkness. They're not going to be part of the kingdom, based on if they believe the gospel of the kingdom or not. And if they, if they are trusting in their goods, and they're trusting in their wealth, then they're going to end up being thrown in the lake of fire because they end up taking the mark of the beast and end up keeping their possessions. Therefore, why not go ahead and sell it and help the poor saints? It's not going to do you any good once the mark of the beast is put in place. So they're there to sell what they have and give it away uh, to help others uh, while they can. 
And so obviously this is a command specifically for the tribulation period. It's not for us today. And they followed it. Acts chapter 4, they sold and they laid it all at the disciples' feet and they uh, distributed as was needed, as people had need. What ended up happening, that kingdom program was uh, temporarily put on hold. The dispensation of grace started with Paul in Acts chapter 9. And then you'll see in Paul's epistles, you see them taking a collection for the poor saints in Jerusalem. The reason they're poor is that they, they obey God's command. They sold all they had. They didn't wait for some burning in the bosom or some call by God or some feeling that they should pray. I mean, that they should sell everything that they have. They obeyed God's command, and as a result, they're poor. Well, that's not what should have happened. They should have became a kingdom of priests. And the kingdom should have started, but as a result, then that gives an opportunity for those in a dispensation of grace to show God's love toward them and to show others, the Gentiles around them, so they may be willing to accept that uh, gospel of grace as well by, giving, by taking a collection and giving it to those poor saints in Jerusalem. So they did obey that command, and it's not for us today because we're not going through the tribulation period. We're not in the kingdom program. We're in the dispensation of grace, and there we're told rather than to take no thought for what we're our life and what we shall eat we're told to go get a job and provide for the members of your family and then also if someone in the household of faith needs need has needs provide for them as well if you have the opportunity to do so um, that's what we should do today um, we need to work and because the, we don't have seven years until the end maybe we do maybe there's another couple thousand we don't know how many years until the rapture takes place uh, so different commands for different dispensations. Okay, so then we go to the next story here. Uh, uh, basically, you have uh, a commandment to watch. In other words, continue to work. This par next parable is to continue to work for the Lord during the tribulation period. They don't know when he's going to come. Uh, it says in verse... Now, we are told in a different parable... Uh, in Matthew that we covered, uh, Matthew chapter 14, if you hold your place and go over there, there are four watches in the night, at least in the Roman, uh, under the Romans, and that last watch, would, of course, would be the fourth watch, and that's when it, the night is a type of the tribulation period. It's, it signifies the tribulation period, and this uh, story here, what happens here in Matthew 14, the disciples are left alone in the night on the sea, and it says there, uh, Matthew 14, verse 25, And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. So it is at the end, the fourth watch being the last watch of the night, it's at the end of the night, or at the end of the tribulation period, when the Lord comes back, His second coming, to pour His wrath upon apostate Israel and the Antichrist, throw them in the lake of fire, and the false prophet as well, and to... Uh, to save his little flock, uh, feed his, pick up his lambs, gather them in his arms, feed them, gently carry them in his bosom, lead them into the kingdom. That's when he's going to do it. But of course, when the watches are, are may not be so clear. So he says there in Luke chapter 12, going back, talking about those servants, they should be watching during the entire night, during the entire tribulation, because they don't know when he will come. In fact, if you, uh, you can let go of Matthew and then go over to First uh, Peter. You know, I'm thinking as I said it. I think it's Second Peter. Yes, it is Second Peter, chapter three. It says there in Second Peter, chapter three, verse nine: The Lord is not slack concerning His promise. In other words, His second coming, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. And it goes on from there. So, in other words, he comes as a thief in the night. He comes at the end of the tribulation period, uh, when it's still night. And, and you're told here, going back, now, now we've got some background information for this parable. We we'll go back to Luke chapter 12, we're told in verse 38, and if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants. In other words, finding them working, and they should work throughout the whole tribulation period. Even though they know he's coming at the end, and the fourth watch, 
the more they're working, the more they can, as that passage in 2 Peter talks about, he he's delays his second coming to give an opportunity for the nation of Israel to repent. In other words, change their mind, get away from that religious system, believe the gospel of the kingdom so that they can enter the kingdom. And so the more that they are watching or the more that the little flock is going out, doing the signs of the kingdom and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, then the more they are going to be blessed, even though they're doing it in the second or third watch, even though he's coming in the fourth watch, they're doing it earlier, well, they're going to be blessed because they bring more into the kingdom so they get a greater blessing and the kingdom for doing so. Notice verse 39, This know that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. The good men of the house there is the Antichrist because the house during the tribulation period is Satan's house. And the one that's in charge for Satan is the Antichrist. He doesn't know, um, we're told in Matthew, you know, not what day nor hour the Son of Man shall come. Uh, and so even though I mean, if you watch for the signs and you're watching and you look at Matthew 24 and you, and you know it's in the fourth watch, you can tell and that way you can give that call like the little flag does in Matthew 25 to those who are sleeping and saying, behold, he's coming. But yet, because Satan is in unbelief, he doesn't believe any of that stuff. He doesn't know what hour the thief is going to come in. The thief is the thief in the night, the Lord Jesus Christ coming in the second coming. He comes, he breaks up that house. It says uh, his, his house has suffered. Yeah, it says that the good men in the house, that's the Antichrist. And know what hour the thief would come, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He would have watched and not suffered his house to be broken through. And so he breaks through and he takes the spoil. That's the little flock. He takes those who are, and that's all of Israel, I should say, who believes, all of saved Israel, the Israel of God, those who believe the gospel of the kingdom and are saved. They takes them, takes them out of Satan's house, takes them away to, be, uh, to go into the kingdom, uh, to God's kingdom. And so that, that's the warning there. Basically, he's, Jesus is warning them to be on the watch, on the watch being not only believing what God says about the end time so that they'll be able to warn Israel, but also to find the lost sheep of the house of Israel during the second and third watches of the night, throughout, in other words, throughout the tribulation period. And so that's his, what he's saying there in verse 40. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Uh, there's still a lot of good stuff to go over here, and we just don't have time. Um, then you have Peter asking a question in verse 41, and the gist of his answer, Jesus' answer, is that although he has said, in Matthew 19, he says to the twelve disciples that they are to sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel and the kingdom, that is a conditional promise. It is conditional upon them enduring unto the end. Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, does not endure unto the end, therefore he is replaced by Matthias in the last verse of Acts chapter 1. So it is the twelve apostles that are the basically the, the twelve who are the twelve at the end of the tribulation period. They're the ones to whom the promise is given. And so the warning that the Lord gives Peter is basically uh, verse 42. It says, the Lord said, who then is that faithful and wise steward? So in other words, he's given that promise to the twelve apostles. But if they choose not to be a faithful and wise steward, they, as Judas Iscariot was not faithful and wise, then they'd be kicked out, replaced by Matthias. And that could happen to any of them. So the Lord is saying, basically, don't rest on your laurels just because I've given this promise. It's a conditional promise based upon you enduring to the end. You need to be a faithful and wise steward so that you can lead more into the kingdom so that you can be in that high position of authority. The high position of authority is only given to those who are the faithful and wise as opposed to those who just barely make it in, sleeping through the tribulation period, not working, and then just believing uh, the gospel at the end. And so he's just basically giving a warning to the twelve, you know, don't just rest on your laurels, but continue to work for the Lord throughout the tribulation period. And that's the gist of uh, what we have there through verse 48. Uh, then verse 49, he says, he warns, he says, I am come to send fire on the earth, and what will I if it be already kindled? The, the, but if I have a baptism, but I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I, how am I straightened till it be accomplished? His baptism is the baptism of death, which will enable the imputed righteousness 
in other words, enable the disciples or the little flock to have life to enter into the kingdom. The fire that he's talking about in verse 49 is the judgment of fire that will come at the end of the second coming. However, the fire is already kindled, meaning that spiritually speaking, it's already there, which is that the refiner's fire is the fire fiery trials of the tribulation period. That whole seven-year period is, is the fire, spiritually speaking. And so it's already kindled, it's already started, such that people have had to start choosing sides. You see there in verse 52, For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two, two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, etc. So in other words, John the Baptist came, started preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus Christ did the same. He sent the 12 out. They did the same. The 70, they did the same. So once John started, that's where the fire started being kindled in that now people had to choose. They either had to change their mind, believe the gospel, or continue as apostate. And if they believe the gospel, well now they have separated themselves from the apostate nation such that you've got houses divided. So that's the fire is that already you're feeling the fire and that there's persecution, there's tribulation starting and uh, between apostate Israel and the little flock and it'll just continue and get worse and worse during the seven years of tribulation period. So he says, I have come not to bring peace as they expected the Messiah to do to bring in the kingdom, but his first kingdom was to kindle that fire, to start it up, to divide basically the wheat from the tares as Matthew chapter 13 talks about to see who is truly going to enter into the kingdom and who is going to be apostate. To make the, tri the fiery trial of the tribulation is going to be that refiner's fire that makes everybody in Israel choose sides. Are you going to be with the true Christ or are you going to be with the Antichrist? Are you going to enter in the kingdom or are you going to be in the lake of fire? And so that fire is already kindled and ultimately he will bring that fire at the end of the, uh, at his second coming, at the end of the tribulation period when he judges um, the apostate people into the lake of fire. Actually, the, technically, the judgment doesn't come till the great white throne judgment after the um, after the millennial reign. Uh, so then, uh, finally, he tells them, uh, concludes the chapter, verses fifty-four through fifty-nine, saying, "People can look in a cloud, uh, look in the sky, and see that a storm is coming. They can see the signs. So too, you should be watching the signs of the times." as I've already given in Matthew chapter 24. And fundamentally, it comes down to belief. If they truly believe in God's word, they will overcome religion. And whatever he says, no matter how crazy it sounds, which it will sound crazy when the Antichrist is quoting scripture, he's quoting the Lord's Prayer, Luke 11, and he's applying it to Satan. And, it, and so what they, what the little flock believes in is going to seem crazy to apostate Israel. But if they continue to trust in God's word, the kingdom program, and they believe what he says, that they are going to believe those in those signs of the time, end times, as he mentions in Matthew 24, and that they will be able to see it so that they can warn the rest of Israel who is slumbering and sleeping so that they will have a basically like a deathbed repentance, basically, and make it into the kingdom, which is sad, but true, that's how most of Israel makes it in. And it's all depending upon the little flock, because if the little flock doesn't have the faith in the first place to watch for those signs and believe that they're happening, then they won't give the warning that the Lord's coming. You better believe the gospel. Uh, so basically chapter 12 is just preparing, bringing edification to the little flock, preparing them for that tribulation period, warning them about the religious system, and then to watch so that they can help prepare others, make it into the kingdom. And also that includes going out from city to city, preaching uh, that gospel to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and their persecution is going to result in the Gentiles hearing as well as they're brought before powers and magistrates and the Holy Ghost speaks through them. So we covered a lot. There's a lot of great detail. I would encourage everyone to, you know, based on the little bits and pieces I gave to just read over those chapters and I'm sure there's a lot more you can get out of it than what I've shared tonight, but that's all we have time for. Thank you everyone for joining us. Next Monday night, join us again at 6 p.m. where we will continue at Luke chapter 13. So let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you for your Holy Spirit that you've given us to give us the spiritual discernment to understand what is for us today and what's not us, 
for us today specifically applying, but at the same time knowing that all the Word of God is given by inspiration of God. And so let us by faith learn from your Word that we may be edified as members of the body of Christ to fulfill those places in the heavenly places um, in that coming eternal life up there. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good night.